Hi, my name is Bart Witte. Um, I'm going to do a talk about the socio-technical future of AI and medicine and why socio and not only technical uh, solutions. Well, this image from Roy Ikeda, um, is that what worries me most? And um, as we digitize, we have perhaps the possibility to break down inequalities or increase inequality. So the effects of digitalization in medicine um, don't touch every single life in, on this planet, but I think we can do this very differently. So let me explain. Um, when I talk today about AI, I'm not going to differentiate between the different parts and subfields of uh, the AI research field. It doesn't um, make any difference because I'm going to first uh, start talking first why we are digitizing. And um, I start with an a uh, professor in social theory from the LMU in Munich, Armin Nazehi, and he published this theory about digitalization. It's in German, it's a book called Muster Patterns. I don't know if it's translated yet, but when reading his book, um, I found one thing very particularly interesting because he simplified digitalization by calling it a duplication of the world through data. And when we digitize, we focus mostly always on solving a problem. Like this is from the Tesla fabric. It's controversial. Yes, I know. But they are trying to build an AI that allows the car to drive autonomously. So they create and duplicate the world through data, but they create also a virtual world that has all these sort so-called edge cases. So the AI in case uh, when there is uh, a UFO on the highway knows how to handle. Um, and so it's a duplication of the world through data to solve the problem of autonomous driving. Now, this little virus has kept us busy in the last few years. It's the COVID virus. Well, in biology, we have been duplicating the world through data since a while. And as we have more compute power and have more data, we can start simulating larger complex organisms that allow us to predict events. And we're probably working in biology towers simulating our whole body so we can predict diseases in our body. We call it digital twins. Um, this is, for example, just the structure of bone marrow as a duplication of the world or duplication of bone marrow through data. And when a surgeon today goes into a heart valve replacement, he starts to uh, take images of the heart that he's going to uh, perform the surgery on. Um, and before the, he replaces the heart valve, he is become friends with the anatomy of, of this heart, which has been visualized. So he gets um, to do a safer job uh, when he does and perform the surgery. Everybody heard about deep mind tackling with alpha fold, the protein folding problem. Well, that's also a duplication of biology, in this case, proteins uh, by data. And as there are certain laws that pro pro prohibit that biology cannot be patented, I come later to that, the whole protein, like all proteins in our body, have been published as an open source database, a duplication of our proteins by data in a database. But when we talk about data, data is so abstract and people are not relating to data. So like, why do we, I don't care about my data. Um, Data is just data, like a date or an, a, 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 some, a number that you put in a field. I'm going to give you a bit of a different feeling about data. And this is an experiment that I found in or a, it's a television show in, in South Korea, but it's an experiment that I found um, on the Internet where they give people the possibility to solve the problem of um, not having the possibility to talk to somebody who is not with us anymore, so somebody who um, has passed away. And in this case, this is a mother that lost her child in an accident, and it was so sudden that she couldn't say goodbye to her child. So what did they do? They took data. They duplicated the world through data, in this case, the daughter, through data. They used videos, images, voice data, and they recreated that daughter in a virtual environment. And this is how this looks like. And this is a different view of data.
And I'm going to stop it here because every time I watch this movie, being a father myself, I, I get the creeps. I get like so much emotions looking at this. And I'm only looking at data and algorithms in a virtual environment. But I see the empathy and the reactions. So there is this connection between the offline and the on online world and the environment. And we all know that Mr. Zuckerberg, who hasn't been really the most generous person giving us access and ownership to our data is now creating his metaverse and is asking us to donate all our biometrical data so we can be part of his world, the metaverse or his metaverse and can play around in this world. So he's creating very new worlds and this is taking very new dimensions. And when we talk about these duplications, perhaps we should talk about um, already existing applications uh, that are kind of problematic. And in this case, it's Replica.ai. It is from something I don't recommend to download. It is an app that asks you to upload all your communication data. So it creates a chatbot. And, and the more you talk to it, it is actually a replica of yourself. And now, if you look at the terms and conditions of this um, a application, you will find that through GDPR protection, you have a lot of rights on your data, but you don't have any rights on the AI model that is trained on your data. That this means you don't have actually the rights to own your replica, your own self, your informational self. And I think this is highly problematic. And through my research and building up the Hippo Eye Foundation, um, I went into a lot of scholar, work of scholars and uh, Luciano Florido, uh, which is a philosopher from Oxford, he taught me like the I, I, that we as people or humans we identify us not only by our biological self anymore, but as well by our informational self. That means that we, me, me myself, is not only something biological, a biological entity but we are connected with our informational entity. And in this off and online worlds, there are interactions that are quite important to understand because these things are not loosely coupled with each other. And then it's really important to see that if we talk about we, that in this we, we have different generations and the youngest one amongst us, like the generation Z, um, feels more themselves in this online world. So their informational self has become more important um, in their life and that's where they live as the biological self. And it feels perhaps a bit like we're heading towards the matrix where we only live in an informational world uh, and the biological self has no importance anymore. And to give you a few examples about these off and online worlds, well, people are using this for creating new business models like Gucci, sold um, this year uh, a Gucci bag for more money than actually the offline bag. The only thing is you don't have anything physically. You own um, an online bag on Roblox um, and it shows kind of already how these things are connected. And Paul Luckley, who is the founder of the Oncolux that Facebook bought, has now his new startup and he's building a new VR set and I don't know if it's a provocation of he's really that crazy, but he has built in microwaves in the headset and tells like to make a game more exciting. If you die in the game, you will die in real life yourself because your brains are going to be smoked by this VR headset. Um, it's an extreme example, but it shows that people are working on this off and online relationship and something you don't might consider, but... Imagine if a Generation Z feels more like herself in this online world and watches the whole time on TikTok movies about liberation, about rights, about uh, female rights, and then comes in her offline world where perhaps her offline world is somehow her virtual world. It is understandable that suddenly 14 years old girls start sticking up their middle finger to the police, even with the risk that uh, they have a death threat later. Uh, but there is this connection from the online world now in the offline world, and it influences society. And this makes me uh, think that we live in a very special time that people and humans can be easily manipulated because we are using all our senses, like 
our ears, our eyes, and perhaps in the future other senses, perhaps even a brain-computer interface that allows other to manipulate our still polyotic emotions. Um, and, if, and if this is the case, we need to watch out what are the rights in these digital worlds. Because when we duplicate the world through data, uh, we as well should perhaps duplicate human rights. We should duplicate our fundamental rights because at the moment what we're doing is we are replacing the rights with terms and conditions of these companies. And, and rights and human values and norms and principles are not globally un unified. Like when you look at the US and look at their healthcare systems, they have a very different way of looking at healthcare. For them, healthcare is driven by Manchester capitalism. It's a purely market-driven system. And it's focused on creating monopolies in a sense. And it has class medicine. And um, it's driven by competition. But the market is, is failing, as we know. In Europe, and we know that we all have the right to privacy in Europe since GDPR. But did you know that you have the right to healthcare, which is described in Article 35. So I expect when we digitize and when we build up and duplicate the world through data in a digital world, that within that digital realm, we also have that right to healthcare and have that fundamental right to privacy. And that when we create a market, we don't build monopolies, but so-called polypolies. And then most of all, build on the principle of solidarity, because that's something that is one of the core values of Europe that differentiates us from other regions. So if you're looking for differentiation in Europe and want to build something unique, then we should learn where we come from and with norms and with values are important for us. And to give you a bit of a feeling how norms and values are even shaping the future, I was watching a Netflix series, Altered Carbon, which is about a science fiction world that is 250 years in the future where we can build skyscrapers which are 3,000 meters high. We can plug in consciousness and plug it out, put it into new bodies with new business models. But then there was this hospital scene. The main actor, girlfriend, is bleeding to death. He's flying with his self-flying car to the hospital. He goes to the emergency care. He needs to identify his girlfriend puts the hand on a scanner, and what happens? She doesn't have enough credits. She's declined from care. And I said, like, how the hell can this happen? They fly around with cars. Like, everybody's flying around with cars. You can plug in a new consciousness, a new body, but healthcare? No, that is still class-based medicine. And it's really strange, because then you're watching the latest scene, the surgery is all technology. It's robots algorithms, it's data and algorithms that are performing surgery. And then you have to ask the question, like, why can we fly with cars? And why can we not have access to healthcare? Perhaps it's based on the lack of uh, fundamental rights. Perhaps it's based on the lack of a functional market. But it's perhaps also based because people know that if you make things scarce in healthcare, people will pay whatever the price they will pay to save their lives. So if we want to change this, we need to democratize. AI will bring a revolution. Digitalization will probably revolutionize healthcare. But if we want to touch that every human body or every human life on this planet, we need to democratize this. And this is an old battle. The democratization of knowledge is something in our analog world that has been going on since perhaps the first text we found from the Assyrians who published their medical text, the Library of Alexandria, which was a center of knowledge for knowledge sharing, which got destroyed. But then in ancient Rome, it was Cicero who created the Atrium Libertatis, the House of Freedom, and said that the only thing what people need is a book and a garden to have freedom. And I rightfully agree with this. This is not only a Western story. Even in Korea, we have found printing blocks with wooden texts where people were sharing knowledge. And even in, in the Tibetan uh, monasteries, there were Buddhist libraries with 8,000 or over 8,000 rolls 
uh, with Tao texts from uh, Taoism that were about sharing knowledge. So democratizing access to knowledge has always been part of the key, but some didn't really democratize that knowledge and kept these libraries quite secretively, such as the Apostle Library in the Vatican. And it was kept secretly because through keeping things secretly, you can get advantage. And in this case, it was selling letter of indulgences. Uh, until, of course, Gutenberg invented the printing press. We all know this story. The printing press generated um, a lot of wealth in knowledge and access to knowledge. But the conversations that Gutenberg had during the time sound very similar to the conversations that I had on Twitter with Carissa Velis, which is a researcher I really truly appreciate, who is excellent in their privacy research, but has a different opinion when I say we need to democratize an open source AI, she warns about the danger about democratization. And it's an ancient discussion because Gutenberg was exactly having these discussions and the abbots or the monks said like, whoa, giving people copies of the Bible or allowing them to print would be something similar to giving a candle to an infant. It's the bad actor argument, argument that people cannot deal with with uh, empowerment. And I think we should go away of this because <coughs> there is proof, like many libraries after Gutenberg published or created a printing press, we made a part of our public infrastructure. Knowledge was being made available and it has been part of our history. We forget these things. Like libraries were the internet in the pre-internet time. We could access them for free we didn't have to pay entrance and um, um, it even became in, in recent times something imp as important that a president of France named a library after him. Now in China, they are focusing perhaps more on the architecture and not on the number of books of these libraries, but still libraries are being very um, present. And I ask myself that where in the digital world, in the digital replication, are our digital libraries because libraries are still places where you can get things for free. It is one of the only few public places where you can live without spending money. Now, in a digital world, where are the libraries I asked before? Well, this is the largest library of the world. And you know where this library is? Well, it's the headquarter of GitHub in San Francisco. Um, GitHub is a platform with now over 100 million people that are registered that are sharing software code. It's the um, place where the largest collection of software code is being stored and people share them under specific license so others can use it for free. And even to think about this, that uh, if you talk about these things, you think that this is for nerds now. No, this has become a sharing hub even for the industry as most <coughs> or half of the participants that are um, um, a member of this platform come from the industry. And sharing knowledge has become in the software world one of the standards, like it creates faster standards, but it's about pre-competitive collaboration. And that software code has become so important that the founders of GitHub want to avoid the Alexandria destruction of their library. And they have filmed uh, a lot of the software code on films and rolls and have stored it in the Arctic fold. Um, uh, so it can, um, in, in case of a catastrophic event, it can uh, survive perhaps humanity in that sense. Now, when we digitize and we use data, we have to ask ourselves the question, what do we do with data? And I'm going to give you an example that I find very um, um, useful because it, it's quite simple, but it shows a bit the problem that we're having with data and AI. And this is about um, a, 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 a dancer, Dorothea Salkali, who in 2010 uploaded her dance on YouTube. And it was probably a dance that she practiced um, months and months to be able to create such a beautiful art. And then there was Glenn Marshall, who is a digital artist, who took that video and used a um, clip from OpenAI to create a new sort of art. Now, that is also beautiful and inspiring, but I don't 
I doubt if he used more than a few days to create his art. And he was the one who got really a lot of awards by creating that video. He got the, the, the in Cannes a short festival award, and then on the Arts Electronica another we mentioned. So you see that artists are now using art of others and then creating new art, which is amazing. I like these things, but we need to discuss about the thing: who owns this? Who owns this new creation? If everything of the movements that you see is actually the movement of Dorothea Saikali, so that's an ongoing discussion. And it's not only an ongoing discussion in the text to imaging world where we are using now these new new sort of AI models that can produce out of text images, but it's also a discussion in what I called before GitHub on this software platform. Because now over the last decade, software coders have been sharing their software code under an open source license. And they do this because they want to share to the common good and others share. And by sharing with each other, they create something much bigger than themselves. Until this shared code has been used now suddenly by Microsoft and OpenAI that trained a so-called model AI model codex on that software code to create a predictor or a predictive AI coding tool called Copilot. And that's created a lot of fuss because it used the open source licensed goods and it creates new code. But that new code is not licensed anymore under that same license. And it's because of that that um, Copilot and Microsoft are now being sued um, in a class action lawsuit for $8 billion because this is a huge discussion. If AI creates new things out of the content that others produce, should that not be published under that same license? Should it be attributed? So we're coming in a large conflict here between AI and data, and we will talk later on the summit about this, about these conflicts. And I think we have to ask ourselves the same uh, question about rights in healthcare. If me or we as a society give access to our data, to the industry, are others allowed to own the extracts that is created by AI or should we or can we made um, um, empowered to license our data under a so-called extended copyleft license so all the extractions out of our data become a common good so we contribute to the common good and to society and humanity by creating open and freely accessible artifacts that can be used by others. And this is not something new or a pipe dream. This is something that we discussed a while ago, because 30 years ago, we had the Human Genome Project, which was a large open source project where all these scientists published on a daily basis their scientific results when they were encoding the first human into four letters. And I never thought I would actually give this person the word, but within that open source project, there was a quite substantial budget for um, ethics. And John Stolston, who was actually leading the ethical discussion, managed to convince our political leadership at that time um, to do something different with the, um, with the extractions with the um, um, human genome code, because at the same time when there was this open source project, there was a biotech who was patenting the whole human genome. And there was this race versus this patenting group of a biotech which already was valued for billions on the stock exchange. And then this happened. We, all of us, share a duty to ensure that the common property of the human genome is used freely for the common good of the whole human race. Used freely for the whole human race. It's a common good. Like the human genome became a common good. And then it's it's kind of um, like um, liberating at the time the alphabet when Gutenberg invented the printing press and not patenting it because it allowed people to write books. And at the same time, like when people say like, when we're not allowed to patent, 
um, we will see less investments. Innovation will go slower. Well, the contrary was a fact because we have the proof that the opening up the human genome led to open innovation, led to people creating things, and it led to $1 trillion economical value creation, which is important. And I believe as well that the price of human genome sequencing at that time was a few billions to price to, to encode the human genome to today $100, that that um, price or um, this exponential growth in capacity and the lowering of the price faster than Moore's law was only possible because it was openly available to all. And this is what is mind-blocking about the situation today because I come from tech. In tech, everything democratizes. You who are watching here to my keynote are using all technology that in 20 years ago you couldn't even afford. Democratization of technology is something that has empowered us, that has enriched us. So if everything goes down, why do we allow data to go up? There is this huge hunger for data, companies buying other companies that are data rich, building walls around that data and not making them accessible. And I think it's because people try to create um, or make things scarce so they can use the business concept of artificial scarcity. So they kind of pseudo create a price on it. And as I mentioned before, this is what happens when we uh, move data or duplicate our world through data from the public sphere to the digital sphere. And in that digital sphere, everything is currently privatized and is running under terms and conditions instead of rights. And to give this a bit more abstraction, I, I um, use the uh, framework of Jürgen Habermas, a philosopher. And um, as we interact as citizens with these public spheres and private spheres, we share data. But our healthcare systems currently are embedded mostly in Europe within that public sphere. Most of that data is in that public sphere where we had the principle of solidarity, where knowledge was openly shared, open access, open science, all these principles that has driven healthcare forward are now being transferred to, or the principles are not being transferred, but uh, to the private sphere. And in that private sphere, there is something very different because in that private sphere, it's about competition. And it's about competition about who can access more data as the other. And it's mostly data accumulations that are following capital concentrations to create economical value. And I think that's not what we should do. We should not shift our data from our public sphere to only our digital sphere. Uh, we're going to talk about this with Tamar Sharon about the transgression, because this means we will end up in a very new healthcare system that might resemble more the one that we saw in the Netflix series Altered Carbon, where suddenly things are scarce that shouldn't be scarce. And we even have to ask ourselves questions. If all data ends up in the private sphere, are people going to extract the social value out of the data? Because if you hear investors, rightfully perhaps from an investor perspective, ask questions if we should cure diseases because it would not be a valid business model. We, with this saying, we know that we need access to even that private data. We need to ensure that we have transparency out of the data we and our healthcare systems produce. So when data is the alphabet that allows our future generations to write digital saving stories, to innovate, to create, um, then we have to look that we create libraries similar as Alexandria and all the others like Cicero who gave public access. And I miss these libraries. They are not available. And we should license these libraries under something that makes it available as a common good, just like we did with the human genome. How we do it is now the European Union has a lot of promises with all their acts, the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, the AI Act, the Digital Service Act and the Digital Market Act. We will discuss this during the summit, um, during the next few days. And we will discuss this next year because there's a lot of things going on, a lot of conflicts um, within these frameworks. And I believe that 
although the intention might have been good from the European Commission, that the current proposals are going more into a transgression from a shift from public to private in healthcare, because um, healthcare is just part of the whole framework. And if we do this, we have to really watch out. And I think we need to go away from a public sphere that is only defined by human rights and a digital sphere that is defined by terms and conditions to a digital sphere that is also defined by human rights, values, norms, and principles. And that if we do so, we need to give uh, or um, incentivize or create laws or create frameworks that there is a data sharing principle. We call it data solidarity. So the digital economy or the private industry is also a sort of obligation or incentive to share data back in that public sphere so we can still extract social value out of that data. Now, I said before that I don't have the feeling that the European Union is going in the right direction. One of these things is based on this sentence that is part of the European health data space where there is written that intellectual property um, can be a part of the data set that is uh, within that um, 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 data space. That means that data is not available to all and there are data islands within that data space that will not be accessible to all. And if this is the case, we just open the door for large privatization efforts and we won't get access to data in the future anymore. Because people are going to build walls, thick walls around this data because that data withholds perhaps the way how you can with an algorithm extract information for finding a new biomarker test or finding perhaps a new drug candidate. And I believe we need to make this openly available in order to accelerate innovation and make it equitable for all. So I oppose the model of artificial scarcity. I believe if things should, are not scarce today, we should not make this scarce because this means if we do so, we are designing a system that is designed or building a system that is designed for inequality. And I think in a sustainable um, economy, or if we want to move towards so even um, a regenerative economy, if, if that is the case, we, we should use other principles. So solidarity is the main principle. Data solidarity should be a driver. So if we create a system, uh, data flows from one to the other, and we create a system that is based on our human rights, on the same norms, same principles, as the systems we have been enjoying in Europe, which are very different again from the systems that we have seen in the US. So people ask me then, how are we going to create value, economical values? Like, well, look at the Human Genome Project. But if you look at the, the, the different steps in differentiation of when you build a product, if you have a monopoly, you probably are not going to go much further than creating a model. But if we perhaps in the future, create a more sharing economy on the models and the data and create data solidarity to collaboration, we can start competing on the service level and on the experience level. And let us be honest, if you look at healthcare, experience sucks. Like if you go to a hospital, if you are a patient, there is no competition in experience because they know you have to go there because they have the knowledge you need to get you a treatment. There is no need to build great experiences. And I think we should go there, drive the competition there and move away from that model that makes things artificial scarce. Does this work? It works beautifully. Like there are many um, case studies we have been collecting. One of these is Open Bionics, who tapped into the wisdom of the crowds. In this case, the Enable community, 100,000 people designing 3D prosthetics and have been adopting this as a medical product. And Open Bionics now offers these um, prothesis, which are smart, for a price which is one-fourth of that what Otto Brock brings to the market, which is a world leader in this space, but does everything in a proprietary mode. Now, if they sell this for ten dollars to $20,000 using 3D printing, decentralized production, and very different supply chains, you can ask yourself how they earn money. Well, they had 
gone to the experience economy because they created a partnership with Disney where they sell add-ons that um, allow you to your child to have an arm that looks like the one of Captain America. Nobody needs Captain America in that sense, but you can buy it and it makes the company profitable. So business models are out there. Open innovation is much faster. So I believe that these companies will disrupt the incumbents in this, in this field uh, because they have a very different innovation structure. Mostly these things start not out of economical uh, goals, mostly People start collaborating because they want to create impact. They, com they, they, com they collaborate based on a shared purpose. And I've been part of these communities in COVID where we used 3D printing and open source designs. This is one of the projects that I didn't contribute uh, anything to, but it was part of that um, uh, global movement that created open source products. In this case, an open source ventilator that can be used by companies to create it then or certify it as a medical device. But the knowledge has been opened and amazing things have happened um, during COVID. And I asked myself the question during COVID, I saw this mass collaboration because the enemy was COVID, the virus. It was taking our freedom. And I always say that as a joke, well, the moment the Russians, the Chinese, the Americans and the Europeans start to collaborate, is the moment where that star from Star Trek is threatening to destroy the world. So we need to ask ourselves the question, what is the enemy that allows us to collaborate in healthcare? Because I see only competition. And for me, that enemy is, re is really uh, inequality. Do we want inequality in healthcare? I don't think so. I don't think anybody wants to have a system that is designed for inequality. So let us choose that to be the enemy and let us design these systems differently so we don't make things scarce anymore as we used to do before. Does this work in AI and in data? It used um, to be questioned, but it doesn't. nobody's questioning this anymore because since this summer we have seen the destruction of the monopoly of open AI with GPT-3 by a large collaborative um, organized by big science that had thousand scientists working together for one year and they open sourced everything, their model, their training data, their methods, their governance model, and it's there for replication. And you see already people replicating and using it. The same thing happened with DALI, you know, the text to AI, which I mentioned before, with something called Stable Diffusion, which was financed by a startup called Stability AI, it created suddenly open access to algorithms that allow us to dream, to hallucinate new things. And it created um, uh, or it, it triggered human ingenuity and creativity. And what you are witnessing today in the world is an explosion of creativity of people using these open source models and going even further. Well, my creativity goes as far as using it <laughs> for um, creating images with a hippopotamus, um, but it works. And others are using this in a very different way. This is like, well, if you can do this with images, we can also do this with video. And amazing things are starting to happen. And perhaps in the future, we can write a whole script of a movie and our children can produce their own movies. It's the democratization effort that allows people then suddenly to do things that are um, used to be unimaginable in that sense. Um, even um, DeepMind's AlphaFold got um, an open source competitor called OpenFold. You see a lot of these efforts coming where people say like, when we have that private sphere or the digital sphere as a duplication of our world, we want in that digital sphere to have artifacts that are open, freely available as common goods. Now, what do we do with hippos? Hippo, as you know, heard before, comes from Hippocrates. And what we are doing is that we are working together with patients um, to create data donations. We want to have these data donations licensed under an extended copyleft license to create a community that suddenly get access to freely available uh, data, but has the obligation to as well publish the AI models under that same license. We believe that if we do this, we can break down global inequalities, accelerate innovation, and build a common layer where we don't compete, 
but work together to destroy inequality. We have a non-profit, we have a for-profit, I'm not going to go deep into that, but we are building a platform to host the community that will allow people to share as well, similar to GitHub, but with healthcare standards. And one of the dreams perhaps is that we then, uh, as this prototype shows, can write text and not create a very beautiful building or painting, but can use and create synthetic data that is non-personalized anymore and <clears throat> can contribute to the data accessibility pro uh, program and, and break down <coughs> the price <coughs> of that data. Is that the end goal? I don't think so. I think AI will go very deep in biology and perhaps in 10 years time, instead of my children writing text for creating a movie, somebody can write a text and it creates a, a, a sequence of a protein that has a certain function. So for example, hey, can you write me a sequence of an enzyme that breaks down plastic? That is only the sequence we should be very careful on the ethical side because we should not give everybody the power to then put these enzymes into real life situations because if you put that enzyme out in the ocean, it probably will eat up the cables of the internet as well. So that was my not so brief introduction of today, but I'm going to go back that we, if we want to counter the, what I call, or what some people call tech feudalism, where we are not owning anything anymore, we should in these digital spheres create common goods. Because digitalization is much more as just solving that single problem. We as entrepreneurs or investors or innovators are all contributing to this. And we need to look at the big picture of that, what we are doing. And we need, if we do this in healthcare, create what I call 100% open ecosystems. We cannot create ecosystems where one is taking everything and not contributing back. We need the principle of solidarity to accelerate inclusive social and economic process, progress. And then what it is my call to policymakers, where are my libraries? Where are the libraries that I can download the artifact? I see academic hospitals um, selling their access to data, which are public goods that are being transferred into the private sphere. Is that what we want to do? Is, is it selling all our assets to the private industry or are we going to learn from history and build libraries just like the Romans did, like the Egyptians did and like everybody did, give people free access to artifacts, not only your government data, but perhaps create spaces where we can unite and collaborate as part of your governmental infrastructure. Open data, um, we will hear that later with Paul Keller on the open paradox, without solidarity, just creates linear transactions from the public sphere to the private sphere. So I don't think this is going to work. We need open data and open licensing. Um, so everybody is... Um, using the same norms and principles. And with this said, let us unite data in solidarity. Let us build on these principles because I believe we truly, if we unite, have a mission or can create uh, something where um, perhaps inequalities in healthcare on a global scale will be a thing of the past. And you all can be part of this by joining the conversation in our Discord server Today and later we will, uh, it's still quite empty, but during the next months um, in 2023, we will have discussions. We want to unite a people, unite data and build on these principles to break down the walls that lead to inequality. Thank you for your attention.